Hello guys, welcome to my channel. The video in focus will actually be looking at the anatomy of the ear. After watching the video, you can also watch the video on the neuroanatomy of the auditory system that is also on this channel. Do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Getting straight into the anatomy of the ear, you're going to find that the ear is going to be divided into an external ear that is um, composed of this auricle as well as the external acoustic meatus, which is this one. Then you're going to have this air field cavity, which is going to be our mid ear. Then we are then going to have the internal or the inner ear, which is this part, right? And functionally, the ear is going to be the organ of hearing, and it's also going to help in maintenance of balance, as we'll describe the semicircular canals, um, as well as the utricle and the sacu, right? Then, if you look at the external ear, it's going to be having the auricle or your pinna, which is this one. And it's actually going to be composed of a single crumpled a yellow elastic cartilage that is going to be covered by skin, which is tightly adherent, which is this one, right? And for this auricle, except its lobule, which is this one, you're going to be having elastic cartilage in those other regions. Right. That is actually different now from the framework of the nose, which is hyaline cartilage in nature. Right. So within this lobule, you'd expect to have fat tissue replacing the elastic cartilage. Right. Um, and you, for the nerve supply of this auricle, you're going to have nerves that supply the lateral surface, then you're going to have nerves that supply the medial surface, that is the back. Right. So. Uh, the upper two thirds for this surface, they're going to be innervated by the auricular temporal nerve, right? Then the lower third, which is this one, it's actually going to be innervated by the great auricular nerve. The same great auricular nerve will actually supply the lower third of the medial surface of the ear. Right. But the difference now will be on the upper two thirds um, on the medial surface the ear that are going to be supplied by the less occipital nerve. The less occipital nerve will actually be having nerve roots, C2, ventral rami, and it's coming um, from the cervical plexus. Right. Then the region of the conche, which is this one, and the region of the eminentia conche, that is on the medial surface, they're going to be supplied by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. And this auricular branch of the vagus nerve, whilst within the petrous part of the tem uh, temporal bone, it's going to receive nerve twigs from the facial nerve. And that is the reason why in ramsay Hunt syndrome, you're going to have ear vesicles in this region actually supplied uh, by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. So it finds that if you actually have uh, the geniculate ganglion being affected, the geniculate ganglion being the ganglion of the facial nerve, if you affect the geniculate ganglion, you're more likely going to have development of um, ear vesicles within the region of the conche, right? That is actually supplied by that auricular branch of the vagus nerve. And that condition is known as ramsay hunt syndrome, right? Then if you look at the lymphatic drainage of the external ear, you'd find that they are what are known as pre-auricular nodes and your post-auricular nodes, right? The post-auricular nodes, they're going to be the mastoid nodes. They'll actually drain the back, whilst the front will actually be drained by your preauricular nodes, which you can alternatively refer to as um, the parotid nodes, right? Then this lymph can also go uh, to the upper group of the deep cervical lymph nodes. We are also going to mention that upper group of the deep cervical lymph nodes when we actually get to the region of the mid to ear as well. Right. Then in terms of your blood supply, you'd actually expect um, a lot of arteries to include the anterior tympanic artery, right? And you also have uh, branches of the superficial temporal artery also supplying the auricle 
The superficial temporal artery is one of the terminal branches of the external carotid. Remember the external carotid will actually end by dividing into the maxillary artery, which will be divided into three parts by your lateral pterygoid muscle. And from the first part, you're actually going to have the deep auricular artery and the anterior tympanic artery. The superficial temporal artery, which is the other continuation, it will actually also supply the auricle of the ear. Right. It will supply the regions of the auricle that are being supplied by the auricular temporal nerve. Right. The auricular temporal nerve is actually a branch of the trigeminal, uh, trigeminal nerve, particularly the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. Remember how it was going to have an anterior division, which is mainly motor, except the buccal nerve, and um, a posterior division, which is mainly sensory. It was actually going to give you the auricular temporal, uh, the lingual, and the inferior ovular nerve. Those are purely sensory, except uh, the inferior ovular nerve, which will end by giving you, of course, the nerve to the mylohyoid, which will supply the mylohyoid muscle, as well as the anterior belly of the digastric muscle. Right. That's the auricular temporal nerve. That's the superficial temporal artery also supplying the region that is being supplied by that auricular temporal nerve, right? Then the venous drainage, it will actually drain uh, to the superficial temporal veins, um, corresponding of course to the superficial temporal arteries. Remember the superficial temporal arteries, they're actually going to be superficial and their powers can actually be used um, to assess for life in surgeries where you cannot easily access uh, the hand for, for a pulse, right? So that's that's that. Then leading straight from the conche, we get into the external acoustic meatus. And notice the external acoustic meatus in its lateral third, it's actually going to be cartilaginous. It's going to be, con the cartilage will be continuous with the cartilage of the auricle, right? And in the, distal two thirds or the medial two thirds is actually going to be uh, bony. That is the, uh, the petrous part of the, or should we just say the temporal bone? Right. So within this mid or lateral third rather, you're going to have uh, modified apocrine sweat glands known as seruminous glands, as well as some sebaceous glands and hair follicles, which is the reason why hair furuncles are actually common in this lateral third. And you're not going to find them in the medial two thirds because you don't expect to have hairs in this region, right? And um, you can also have appearance of hairs from this region, which are actually Y-linked, meaning to say it actually occurs in the males, right? Then, so this is, um, the external acoustic meatus, and more medially, it's going to be separated from the mid to ear by the tympanic membrane. And notice the tympanic membrane, it's placed obliquely in such a way to, as to pick um, sound vibrations or sound waves from the ground. It's going to be placed at an angle of about 55 degrees. And as a result of this, you notice that the flow of the external acoustic meatus, as well as this anterior wall, they are going to be longer as compared to the roof, which is this one, and the posterior wall, which is this one, right? Then if you look at um, the nerve supply of this external acoustic meatus, notice how you are going straight from the conche into are the external acoustic meatus. So you'd find that the roof, which is this one, and the anterior wall of this external acoustic meatus, they'll actually be innervated by the auricular temporal nerve, right? But the auricular branch of the vagus nerve will actually innervate this posterior wall and the flow, right? Then the blood supply, you're going to have the deep auricular artery, which we said was actually coming from the first part of the maxillary artery, as well as the anterior tympanic artery, which is also coming from the first part um, of the maxillary artery. And also supplying um, this external acoustic meatus with oxygenated blood is the posterior auricular artery. The posterior auricular artery is one of the two 
posterior branches of the external carotid. Remember the external carotid was going to have one medial branch, you are sending pharyngeal, then it was actually going to have two and three anterior branches rather. That is um, uh, the thyroid vessel, which is your superior thyroid. Then you had um, the lingual and the facial. Then coming from the posterior surface, you then have uh, the posterior auricular artery as well as the occipital artery. That posterior auricular artery will also provide blood supply to the external acoustic meters. And remember, embryologically, this external acoustic meters will actually be derived from the first pharyngeal cleft. And the auricle will develop from six axonal helocs that are actually going to be surrounding the first cleft, three on either side, right? Then this tympanic membrane will originate from what is known as the first pharyngeal membrane. This first pharyngeal membrane will be having a part that is coming from ectoderm, a part that is coming from endoderm, and a middle part which is actually coming from mesenchyme. In such a way that in an adult, you'd find that the core of this tympanic membrane will be fibroelastic tissue that will be covered externally by the stratified squamous epithelium that is characteristic of the skin and internally by the simple cuboidal epithelium that is characteristic of the epithelium that we actually find within the middle ear, right? And this tympanic membrane, right, in terms of structure, this being the tympanic membrane, in terms of structure, it's going to have what is known as the pars tensor, and it also has the pars flaccida in this region. And the pars tensor makes up um, almost 90 to 95% of the tympanic membrane. And this pars flaccida is actually going to be a small triangular region that is going to exist between this anterior malleolar fold and the posterior malleolar folds. Right. This pars flaccida alternatively can also be referred to as the sharp nose membrane. Right. Then the rest of the tympanic membrane is the pars tensor. Right. The only difference uh, between these two regions is that within the pars flaccida, you're going to be having loose areolar tissue. Your loose areolar tissue will actually replace um, the middle part that you're going to be finding within this, um, this pars tensor, right? So within the pars flaccida, you'd actually expect uh, to have no fibrous tissue. As we said earlier on, it was going to be fibroelastic tissue covered externally by stratified squamous and internally by your simple cuboidal epithelium. So within the pars flaccida, that is actually replaced by loose areola tissue. Right. And it's going to be a triangular region that is actually existing between the lateral process of the malleus, not the, no, the anterior malleolar fold rather, and the posterior malleolar fold. Right. Then in terms of the arterial supply of this tympanic membrane, you're going to find that the outer surface will be supplied by the deep auricular artery that we also said was going to be supplying your external acoustic meatus, right? Then the inner surface will be supplied by the anterior tympanic artery, which is a branch of the first part of the maxillary artery. And of course, if you're going to be having an anterior, you'd expect to also have a posterior. The posterior tympanic artery will also supply the medial surface of the, the medial surface of the tympanic membrane. And this posterior tympanic artery, it will actually be a branch of the stylomastoid artery. That stylomastoid artery will actually be a branch of the posterior auricular artery, which we said was actually coming from the posterior surface of the external carotid. Right. Then in terms of um, venous drainage, you'd find that the outer surface will drain to the external jugular, whilst the inner surface will actually drain into the pterygoid venous plexus, as well as the transverse sinus. Right. That will be the venous drainage of the inner surface. Then the nerve supply, if you understood the nerve supply, 
of the external acoustic meters, it will be a bit easy to understand the nerve supply of the lateral surface of this tympanic membrane. Right. So you'd expect the anterior half to be innervated by the auricular temporal that we said was innervating the roof um, of, your, of your meters. Then for the posterior surface or the lower surface of this, you'd expect the auricular branch of the vagus that was supplying uh, the posterior as well, the posterior wall as well as the flow. Right. Then the medial surface will be innervated by uh, the tympanic branch of your glossopharyngeal nerve through a plexus known as the tympanic plexus that we're going to describe shortly with the middle ear. Then um, getting straight into the middle ear, the middle ear is going to be an air-filled um, cavity. Um, that is the shape of a cube that is compressed from side to side. Right? And if you look at the middle ear, the vertical diameter and the anteroposterior diameter they are actually going to be the same. What's going to be different is going to be your transverse diameter. That is going to be different at the roof, the middle part, and the floor part. With the roof being the widest, the middle part being the narrowest, and um, the floor part being intermediate. Meaning to say, it assumes the shape of a cube that is compressed from side to side. And if you look at it, it actually resembles uh, a red blood cell. Right? If you know the red blood cell. And this middle ear, it's going to be uh, communicating with the pharynx through the auditory tube. And it's also going to be communicating with the mastoid antrum through the additors that you actually find in the posterior wall of the middle ear, as we are about to describe the walls of this middle ear. And the middle ear is actually subdivided into three parts, right? You're going to have a part that is lying just adjacent to the tympanic membrane, and that is going to be your meso tympanum. And you're going to have the part that lies above, above this um, tympanic membrane, and that is going to be the epitympanum. The epitympanum will actually be composed or actually be having the head of the malleus as well as the body and the short process of the incus. Remember within the middle ear, you're going to be having ossicles to include the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, so named due to their shape, right? Then the part that is below um, the tympanic membrane, that is going to be the hypotympanum, and the hypotympanum actually contains nothing, right? Then the rest of the structures that are within the mesotympanum, Right. So the mid to ear, it's going to be having a roof, a flow, an anterior wall, uh, a posterior wall, a medial wall, and a lateral wall. Since you are coming from the exterior, it would be customary to describe the lateral wall first. Right. So this is going to be the lateral wall. And notice on the lateral wall, you're going to be having the tympanic membrane, which is this one. So this is going to be our tympanic membrane. And the tympanic membrane will separate the mid to ear from the external ear, right? That is what you find on the, on the lateral wall, right? And also from this diagram, I would want you to notice the presence of the cord tympani nerve as it passes lateral to the... So this is the long... Um, long limb of the of the incas, right? Then this is going to be the hand of the malleus. So notice this called the tympani nerve. It's actually going to pass lateral to this process of the incas, but medial to the hand of the malleus. Right? This is also something that you notice on the lateral wall of the middle ear. Right? Then I guess it will be easy to then end with the medial, medial wall as we get straight into the internal ear, right? Then if you look at the anterior wall, right? The anterior wall in its lower part, it's going to be separated from the internal carotid artery, which is this one. The internal carotid artery in this region, it will actually have a plexus of nerves around it that are sympathetic. 
right? And some of those nerves, they're going to form the superior and the inferior carotico-tympanic nerves that also go and take part in the formation of the tympanic plexus on the medial wall of the ear, right? Then in the upper part, right, the, you're going to have an opening for the auditory tube, which is this one, then an opening for the tensor tympani. And these two, they are going to be separated by a bony projection, which extends to the medial wall of the ear as the processaris cochlear reformis. Right. So on the anterior wall, you have this. Uh, then you have the internal carotid, you have the auditory tube. That would then be the link between uh, the middle ear and the pharynx. And as you get into the auditory tube, the epithelium actually changes from being simple cuboidal to um, a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium that you actually find within this auditory tube. Meaning to say the middle ear represents the middle portion of the outpouching of the pharynx. With the auditory tube being the proximal, the middle ear being the middle, and the mastoid antrum being the most distal. Right. So we talked about the internal carotid, we've talked about um, the opening for the auditory tube as well as the opening for the tensor tympani muscle. Then if you look at the posterior wall of the middle ear, right, you're going to have um, the posterior wall separating the middle ear from the mastoid antrum, where you'd expect to have these mastoid ear cells. So you have the adductors um, ad antrum that leads into this mastoid, uh, into this mastoid antrum. Then you're going to have um, the vertical part of the facial canal, which is this one, right? The the oblique part, which is this one, it's going to exist. Um, on the medial wall of the ear. Right? And notice the presence of the geniculate ganglion, which is this one. Right. Then you can also expect to see the posterior canaliculi um, of the quadrant tympani nerve also on that posterior wall. Right. And if you then look at the roof, the roof of the middle ear will be having a very thin plate of um, the temporal bone known as the tegmen tympani that also extends posteriorly as the tegmen antrum forming the posterior or the superior wall of the posterior relation of this middle ear which was our mastoid antrum meaning to say infections of the middle ear can actually spread into the overlying temporal lobes then the inferior wall is also going to be having um, a very thin plate of bone that is our floor, and it's going to be separated um, by the bulb of the internal jugular vein, which will actually be within this notch. Right? And notice the tympanic nerve also passes through, or the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve, if we may say, passes through an opening in the floor of the mid to ear, and it goes to ramify on the promontory of the, of the medial wall, that is as a result of the first basal turn of the cochlea to form this tympanic plexus. That we say it also receives the superior and the inferior carotid tympanic nerves that are actually coming uh, from the plexus that is around the internal carotid artery. Right. So the mid, on the medial wall, you'd expect to have uh, the tympanic plexus, you'd expect to have the promontory that I've mentioned. Then you have what is known as the oval window, as well as the round, the round window. This being our round window, right? The oval window is actually kidney shaped, or you can say reniform shaped, and it's going to be a reniform aperture that is located above and behind uh, your promontory. Whilst this round window, it's located below and behind your, your promontory. And um, the oval window, that's where you'd expect to have the foot plate of the steps and the annular ligament actually attached to the mucous membrane that closes it off. 
right? Another round window, you'd expect to have the secondary tympanic membrane that separates the scalar tympani from the middle ear cavity. Then um, infections of the middle ear, uh, that's going to be referred to as otitis media. And otitis media is actually going to be more common in children due to a short uh, pharyngotympanic tube or your auditory tube. So you can have infections passing retrogradely back to the middle ear easily due to the shortness of this pharyngotympanic tube. Right. Then other complications of um, Otitis media include, include um, facial paralysis because you can actually affect the facial nerve. Because if you see the facial nerve, it will exist within the facial canal as it leaves the internal acoustic meatus where it was traveling with the vestibular cochlear nerve and the labyrinthine artery. So it will, it will actually be affected as it passes through the oblique part um, as well as the vertical part of the of the facial canal before it actually emerges at this style of mastoid foramen. And um, you can also have meningitis and temporal lobe ab abscess, because remember we said in the roof, we have a very thin um, plate of bone that take men tympani. All, all of those can actually be complications of otitis media, right? And if it's going to extend more posteriorly, you can end up having uh, cerebellar problems. That's now a neurological problem. Right. Then if you look at the mid to ear, it's going to be characterized by having these, uh, these bones, that is the malleus, the incus, and the steps. And the malleus will actually articulate with the incus at the incuidal malleal joint, that is going to be a synovial, sedo shaped joint. Whilst the incus and the steps will actually articulate as well at another synovial joint, that is of the ball and socket variety. Right. So if you look at the malleus, it's going to have a head, it is a neck, it is an anterior process, a lateral process, and the end of the malleus that actually attaches onto the tympanic membrane. Then if you look at the incus, it is a body, a short limb, and a long limb, which is this one. Right. And this incus, it's envy shaped, and it actually resembles the premolar tooth. Then this is going to be the steps. It's going to have a head, an anterior limb, a posterior limb, and the foot plate. The foot plate is what actually attaches at the, um, at the oval window. Right. And if you look at those ossicles, they're actually going to be covered by a squamous epithelium, different from the simple cuboidal epithelium that you're finding within um, the mid to ear generally, right? Then also in the mid to ear, you're going to have two very important muscles, your tensor tympani and the stapedius muscle, which embryologically they're derived from uh, the first pharyngeal arc and the second pharyngeal arc respectively. If you go watch the video on the neuroanatomy of the auditory system, you notice that we, we mentioned the reticular system actually having communications with the nucleus of the trigeminal nerve as well as the nucleus of the facial nerve. So you'd find that those communications, they basically work in such a way as to dampen sound, right? Meaning to say a problem with the tensor tympani or the stapedius muscle can actually result in what is known as hyperacusis. Right. So those two muscles, um, I wouldn't really doubt much into origin and insertion, but you can appreciate that the tensor tympani will be innervated by the nerve to the medial pterygoid, which on top of supplying this muscle will also supply the medial pterygoid muscle as well as the tensor palati. Right. Whilst uh, your stapedius muscle will actually be innervated by your your facial nerve which is the nerve of the second act right and if you look at these muscles the tensor tympani attaches to the malleus the stapedius attaches to the steps as its name implies the incus is devoid of any muscular attachment right then if you then look at the blood supply 
of the middle ear. Um, to conclude on the middle ear, it's mainly going to be provided by the anterior tympanic artery. That we said was a branch of the first part of the maxillary artery. And you also expect the stylomastoid artery through its posterior tympanic artery. Those are going to be the main branches that are actually going to be supplying the middle ear. Right? But you also expect the petrosal branches of the middle meningeals whatsoever. They'll also supply the middle ear with blood. Right. Then if you look at the, the venous drainage, it's going to go to the pterygoid venous plexus, right? while some of it will actually go um, to your superior petrosal sinuses. Right. Then if you look at the lymphatic drainage, you expect to have the parotid lymph nodes that we said were your preauricular. Then you also expect to have the retropharyngeal nodes as well as the upper tip cervical group of lymph nodes that I mentioned earlier on. Right. Then if you look at the nerve supply, Right. It's, since we mentioned the tympanic plexus and we now understand it, the tympanic plexus will also supply the middle ear and also the medial wall of the tympanic membrane. Right. Then, um, of course, the facial and the mandibular nerve will supply the muscles uh, with motor innervation. Right. Then um, embryologically, the middle ear will be derived from the tubo tympanic recess that will actually be um, coming from the first pharyngeal pouch. That's its connection with the pharyngotympanic tube, which remains narrow as the middle ear actually bulges. Right. Then if you look at the internal ear, it's easier to understand the embryology first than get the gross anatomy. Because um, during the fourth week of development, you're going to have appearance of what is known as um, an otic vesicle. The otic vesicle is going to have a ventral outpocketing and a dorsal outpocketing. The ventral outpocketing will actually be the sacu, or the dorsal one will be the utricle. From the sacu, you're going to have appearance of the cochlear duct, and the two, they're actually going to be united by the ductus reunions, whilst from the utricle, you're going to have the semicircular canals as well as the endolymphaticus duct. The semicircular canals will actually remain in communication with the utricle as we will find as we discuss the gross anatomy. And if you then look at the utricle and the sacu, they will remain um, in communication through the, the ductus utric utriculo circularis. Right. So that's a general overview of the embryology, but there is more to it. But the video is focusing mainly on the gross anatomy. So if you look at the internal ear, it's going to be having a membranous labyrinth that is filled with um, endolymph. And this membranous labyrinth, it will be bathed within the perilymph of the bony labyrinth. Right. So you'd find that the bony labyrinth will contain the membranous labyrinth. And for the bony labyrinth, you'd expect to have the vestibule, which contains the utricle and the sacu. Then you have the cochlea, which contains the cochlear duct. Then you have the semicircular canals, which contain um, your semicircular ducts. Right? And endolymph is going to actually resemble intracellular fluid by having a high level of potassium that is actually being pumped into the, into the fluid by your stria vascularis, which is a very specialized epithelium that we find um, in the internal ear, which is also going to be the only vascularized epithelium in the body. And the perilymph is actually going to resemble your um, extracellular fluid. And these two actually have different drainage patterns, one going to the subarachnoid space and the other one actually going to the cerebrospinal fluid. Right. So for the internal ear, um, this is going to be the cochlea. And notice it's going to be having um, tens, about two and a half tens. And embryologically, these tens would have been completed by the eighth week of development. Then this is the sacu. Notice the sacu remains connected to the cochlea. Then this is going to be the utricle. And notice the utricle is larger as compared to the sacu. Right. 
And the utricle is actually in communication with the semicircular canals or your semicircular ducts, which are these ones. Right. And this is the utricular circular duct that I said remains joining of your, your ventral outpocketing, the circular, and the dorsal outpocketing, which is going to be the utricle. Right. And this is the ductus endolymphaticus that is going to be opening in the region of the vestibular aqueduct, which is this one. Right. The utricle and the psyche, they're mainly going to work in linear motion. And the utricle will particularly work in horizontal linear motion, whilst the psyche will work in the vertical linear motion. The semicircular canals, characterized by having one dilated end and one non-dilated end, that is the crystal non ampullae they are going to be working in rotational motion. Right. So if you look at, um, if you then look at these components histologically, you'd find that the utricle and the psyche, they're going to be having the macula, which is going to be associated with um, the autolytic membrane, right? But for, so the utricle and the, and the, and the circuit, they have that macula that is similar histologically. And that is also similar histologically to the, um, to the crystal that you find within the semicircular ducts. The only difference is they'll actually lick um, the autolith within their cupola. So they have a cupola as opposed to the, as opposed to the, autolytic membrane that is basically proteoglycans that we find within the utricle and the psyche, right? Then if you then look at the cochlear duct, you're going to be having the scala vestibuli, which is this one. Then you have the scala tympani, which is this one. These two scala though actually be having perilymph and they are continuous with one another at the helicotrema. Then the middle portion, which is this one, that is going to be the cochlear duct. And we can also refer to it as the scala media. Right? And notice within the scala media, you're going to be having the outer air cells, you have the inner air cells, then you have the support cells to include the pillar cells, the data cells, the phalangeal cells, and whatsoever. These outer air cells, they're mainly for modulation. Right? And they receive most of the olivocochlear bundle of nerve fibers that are actually going to be acetylcholine um, or cholinetic fibers, if we may say. Then the inner air cells, they make up 95% um, of the afferent axons that actually leave the internal ear. And their stereocilia or their hairs at the apical ends, they'll actually be in contact with this tectorial membrane. Right? Within the psyche and the utricle, you also expect to find hair cells. That is, you would expect to have um, type 1 hair cells as well as uh, type 2 hair cells. The type 1 hair cells, they're going to be rounded and they're the less numerous ones, whilst the type 2 hair cells, they're actually going to be uh, the more numerous ones and they're, they're going to be collaminar and they're going to be associated with um, buton, terminal buttons of nerve fibers, right? That's the difference in the hair cells that you actually find within the psyche and the utricle, right? Then notice this is going to be the vestibular membrane or your resonance membrane, separating the scala vestibuli from the scala media. Then this is going to be the basilar membrane, separating the scala, the scala media from the scala tympani. If you look at the neuroanatomy video that I also posted on the auditory system, these things are explained more from a neurological point of view, right? And this is going to be your organ of corti, right? That's where you'd expect uh, the transduction processes for audition to actually take place, right? Then for your bony labyrinth, you'd actually expect to have the, the cochlea itself, which is going to, of course, to be having those basal tens. And remember the first basal ten is what is going to cause 
uh, the promontory that we then uh, appreciated on the media war of the middle ear. Right. That's, that's the cochlea. Then the semicircular canals, they're also going to be arranged in, in, in three planes. You're going to be having the anterior one, the lateral one, as well as the superior one, which alternatively you can refer to as the posterior semicircular canal, right? And these canals, they're almost like um, two thirds of, they're almost like two thirds of a circle and they're dilated at one end to form the ampulla. And then the other end, they're not dilated. That would be the crystal non ampullae. And if you notice, um, they're going to be three in number, meaning to say you'd expect six openings, but they actually have five openings as opposed to the six that you'd actually be expecting because part of this anterior semicircular canal will join this posterior semicircular canal to open at one point. That is then their non dilated parts, the um, crista non ampullae. Right. So that's uh, basically the anatomy of the ear. Um, I hope you enjoyed and got something from it.